We're going to be talking about a web application firewall today, and it's specifically FuseGuard. I'm not a security guy, so um, this should be interesting. But our company, my company I work for, does uh, interacts with banks, and so we have to be really secure. Um, and then we have pen tests, penetration tests that happen every year. And then we get a stack back that we got to fix with our website. And this is actually going to uh, a web application firewall is actually a it actually is a countermeasure. So it'll stop or block those from going on. That doesn't mean you still don't have to do secure coding on your side, like using uh, HTML format or even the eSAPI ones to like fix. Uh, cross-site scripting and other things, or CF query param. You still need to do that on your side through the code, but this will actually block those, hopefully, from happening before it even hits your code. So a web application firewall is, it can be an application like this is, it can be a plug-in, if, and then this actually is filters too. So you can create your own filters, and this one comes out of the box with maybe 15, 20 filters and then you can set the security levels on what you want to block, what you want to log. So generally, this, these uh, block cross-site scripting. If you're not familiar with what that is, well, I have some demos. And then uh, SQL injection. So we'll see some demos of that. And then primarily a web application firewall is used to secure a web application and detect the vulnerabilities. And it works really good with code that's already existing, like an existing application. So you don't want to spend the time to go through and secure all that. You could use this FuseGuard, and then you wouldn't have to actually touch any of your code. And you could feel a lot more uh, secure. You could feel a lot more better about your old code that you didn't have to go back and CF query prime everything, because uh, this f web firewall will be protecting it. So. It, uh, it is not dependent on the web application, but most of the time they're not. This one, you do have to add a little snippet of code in your on application start or in your maybe a, your application.cfc. So it's about 10 lines of code you, you do have to add to your application. So, and it's a countermeasure. We said that a little bit. So these are defensive technologies used to detect, deter, and deny attacks. So that's what this, uh, this web firewall is going to do. And then these are the key things that it does, authentication, uh, access control, session management, uh, input validation, error handling, logging, cryptology. Uh, FuseGuard does some session management, does some input validation for like cross-site scripting. It handles the little errors and logging it does a lot of. So, uh, and then authentication, it can check from foreign posts, like if somebody was like a hacker was authenticated to your site, and then they had a form somewhere else, and then they were submitting to your site. This will check for uh, form post or foreign phone for or foreign posts. So, the benefits and risks of a web uh, application firewall is they're well suited for stuff that's already in production, like we said. And then, so you don't have to touch that code. And then there's no changes to the application itself, so you don't have to worry about if you introduce new bugs. And there's a central error that happens, and we'll see that error. And then what's nice is you could use this configuration for all your applications, and that way they're all, your security is all at one level, you know for sure. Because if your person coding it might not be coding securely, at least you know your app has a level of security through this firewall. Uh, some of the risks are training. This one wasn't too hard for me to learn. I started playing with it about uh, three weeks ago, I think, or four weeks ago, when we got back our penetration tests. So um, false positives, that's a risk. You might get a lot of false positives. And when I implemented this at work, what we did was we put it on production, and then we just logged it for about two, three weeks, not block anything. We just logged the, what it was catching. And then last weekend, we started cranking it down a little bit. So we started to, like what he considers threat levels eight, he has threat level one through eight. And so we started blocking threat levels eight, nine, and 10. So we're just kind of slowly kind of blocking, kind of ratcheting down the security. And so false positives, that's the big thing for risks. And then the cost effectiveness. Some of these, I think Barracuda has a web application firewall. 
think you're probably going to pay ten thousands of dollars for it. And this one, the price isn't very, very much at all, considered how much work it would have took to for us to go through all the code and do what needed to be done to protect it that way. Um, I think it's three fifty if you just want to protect an application. If you wanted to protect a web server, I think it's uh, $9.99. And then if you wanted more than that, you can work with Peter and he can get you licenses that way too. So that's, that's a risk. It might be very cost uh, efficient. So um, I don't know if you guys heard of OWASP. If you start doing anything with security, that's the website you'll go look at. And it's very well done. It's very technical. It'll have like the security threat and then how they produce it and what your countermeasures are. It's a very, very technical OWASP. That's a O-W-A-S-P. And so they came out with the web security threat levels or threat risks from uh, 2010. And so they gave you a 10 of them. And what we're going to be talking about a little bit is uh, this uh, number one, which was injection. Uh, it might be SQL injection or it might be some other type of injection. And then their number two was cross-site scripting, which is when somebody might add some little snippet of code into your form, for example, and then when it posts, it would come back and then they might have a Java, JavaScript or like a link in there that causes problems. And then broken security and authentication was uh, session management was number three. And then another one that I skipped number four because number five FuseGuard protects against that cross-site script forgery, which we talked about, like maybe the hacker put a form or an image on another website. Like if it was Facebook, you might be logged into Facebook all the time, no matter what web page you go to. And so they might have an image that if you went to the hacker's website, that would load and then might call Facebook and maybe like their page or something. Because it, it would think you're, you're authenticated and you're, you'd make the call to Facebook from your browser. That's a cross-site request forgery. And then the nice thing about this is they're, they require the least amount of work with apps already in production. So that's the key to um, The links at the end, there was, uh, I used pretty much three pages for this presentation, three links. And the one with the best practices, it's really, it's like white page, like one of the best, best white pages I've seen. And it actually breaks down, like if you're using a, a new app or one that you're like just beginning with, one that might need moderate work and one that needs uh, considerable work. So it breaks that down and then it breaks down if uh, what, uh, like what volume of work it would take and then what type it would implement. Like a, if you wanted to use a web application firewall, it'll tell you how hard that would be to use. So I definitely check this out because it's very interesting to see, see that. So um, the other top risks you can, we can talk about just a little bit here. So this is the OWASP website. And so you can see it's very, uh, they do a very good job. And so these are some other ones. Insecure direct object references, I assume that one might be if you have like PDFs or something right, right under your web root. Somebody could go directly there without being authenticated. And that's probably that one. Um, security missile configuration, that's what they thought was number six. Uh, insecure cryptology storage, that's probably talking about not using hash and salting your passwords or that uh, like social security numbers, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, this list is very good if you if you wanted to check it out. And then, like I said, each one of these, they usually have like who's vulnerable, how do you do what's what's the steps to protect it against, and then they give you even more research uh, resources on how to how to look at it, and they give you scenarios. So if you really wanted to dive into the security stuff, OWASP is the website to go check out. Um, FuseGuard blocks uh, malicious file uploads. This one kind of came in handy a couple weeks ago. I have a new person and she was uh, working on making sure that Mimi types were the right ones for file uploads and the extensions matched. And so FuseGuard will actually do that for you too. I don't know if it'll check Mimi types. We can actually dive into the code, but it'll check the file extension and it'll block it before it even gets up to the server. 
because we were actually having to upload it to the server sometimes and then check and then maybe delete it. So FuseGuard will block it before it even gets uploaded to the server. And then it does cross-site scripting, SQL injection, session hacking. This one's pretty interesting. I never, I've used CF location, you know, 10 years, and I never really thought much of when it added the CF token and the CF IDE at the end of it. But that's a big security risk, and that's covered in Peter's uh, checklist, too. Because what happens is, and we'll show a demo of it, somebody could, like, a, Bob goes to your website, and then he has CF token at the end of the URL, and he copies that and sends it to Mary, and she clicks on the link. She would be authenticated as Bob if the session didn't time out. So that would be session hijacking. So um, he can block that, and then uh, cross-site uh, script or cross-site request forgery, uh, this other CRLF injection. I think that's with carriage returns. Do you know? Is that yeah? Um, and then tr uh, path traversing attacks where you can check the slashes, and then dictionary. This one's kind of neat. So you can set how many levels of attempts you would say is okay. So we set ours at ten. So if we get password pinged like uh, more than ten times, then it would be blocked. So, why would you want to use FuseGuard? Because, as you'll see, it's uh, actually CFML code. So you can get in there and see his filters, see what levels he's setting stuff on. You could add, you could change that stuff. You could add new filters if you had specific ones you wanted to check. And this is all happening on request start. So it doesn't even get to the other pages if it gets blocked. So, um, and then you can log and any requests or potentially malice requests. Um, it's easy to add existing applications, which is a big thing I've been talking about, is you don't have to cop, you don't have to, if you had some old app like 10, from like five, 10 years ago, and you didn't want to go through and see CF query param everything, you could put this with 10 lines of code in your application.cfm, and then it probably, it would block the SQL injections and other attacks. So you don't have to spend time going through your old applications. And then it, there's a configurator you'll see, and you can set those to however you want. So uh, it's customizable, and it's written in Cold Fusion. And then it's thoroughly tested. Peter Freetag is a very smart guy, and he has hundreds of unit tests behind this, and he's researched a lot to, to get this product going. And it supports all those versions of Cold Fusion. Uh, we'll be running Rilo on mine and then open Blue Dragon. One thing I found out when I was doing this this weekend is the trial version, he uses CF in code, I think, to gerbil the, the uh, Cold Fusion code. And that wouldn't work on open Blue Dragon or Rilo. So he gave me a, a copy to use of the actual code. So, um, and then you can set up a database if you want, which we do. We have a database. So, it, all the potential threats are put in the database and we can scan and see what's going on. And it supports Microsoft SQL, or Microsoft SQL Server, uh, MySQL, and then this is kind of nice. The Derby, if you're using Cold Fusion 9 or above, I think it's, or 8 or, eight or greater, is uh, Derby is built into Cold Fusion. So that all you have to do is go to his, uh, he has a derby.cfm page. You type in some information and he'll create the database for you through through the Cold Fusion page. And then, like, uh, licensing. So if you wanted to secure one application, it's 350 If you wanted a server, it's $1,000. And this is, I, I think this is a no-brainer from what it does because you don't have to spend all your time. I mean, you should be doing CF Query Pram and that stuff on your code, but if you're not, or if you missed one, the, this web firewall would, would catch it. Would, would not even let the SQL injection happen on the page. So, and then he offers uh, some support too. He's been really responsive to me, like on Twitter. I'll ask him a question, because some reason we, uh, I'm using the ID validation filter to make sure it's an actually I ID, anything that has ID in the va variable name. And for some reason, the I think it was the JS form session, or maybe it was in the session scope, the JS something, was getting caught, and so he, I sent him a tweet, and he responded within like 10, 15 minutes. Told me how to ignore that. So now I'm not logging that, because I, because when we first implemented this at work, we did it with a, 
no blocks and we just logged everything and it logged a bunch. That was the false positives I was talking about. I mean, we had um, one of our clients, their IPs are actually always switching. They're from a bank and they're the same, they're at their computer and they must be going through some, I'm not a network guy, but their IP when it gets to us is different between requests. And so it was thinking, it was treating it as a level two threat level as session hijacking thinking, well, this guy logged in, his, his IP address is this number, and then his next request, it's something else. So uh, FuseGuard was thinking it's, it was a level two threat level because that IP address was switching, and it could have been somebody that stole his session. So we uh, stopped, stopped logging that. And then for session hijacking, I think uh, level five was if the client changes. So if the person's logged in, as in Mozilla Firefox, and then all of a sudden their next request there as like a Chrome or something, this would catch it and it classifies it as a five level security threat level. So you could block that if you wanted to, but we're just logging that now to see how many times that happens. I think over three weeks we had that happen once for our clients, and then he considers a level 10 for session hijacking when both those happen at the same time. So you could block that. So you, it's it's very customizable. It's it's very cool. I have had a lot of fun playing around with it for the last three weeks or so. So these are the resources that I've used to do this uh, presentation. The OWASP um, was very very interesting to read, and then the FuseGuard documentation is really good too. So we can get in, and these links are on my website hanky.ws. And then I have this GitHub with what the demo code we're going to look through, look at tonight. So this should be interesting because we'll be changing code on the fly. So let's look at the demo app. So this is Bootstrap or Twitter Bootstrap theme. It was it's all the rage. I don't know within the last six months or a year or so. So it's a CSS uh, theme, and so I, I use that to set up my templates. And so what we're going to look at here is some SQL injection. And so I have a database behind here. And I don't know if you guys can see that. So it outputted Ryan here. And so I can click on Ryan, and then maybe it takes me to Ryan's profile or something. And it passed in the ID here. And so I, I didn't CF query param this. So let's see, where's my mouse? So this is vulnerable to SQL injection. So if the hacker came in and said, well, I see that ID there, now I'm just going to add or one equals one, see what happens. So now it gave Mike, Mark, and Ryan. And then he's like, oh, so he's not, he's not protecting against SQL ejection. So now I can maybe add this and see all his tables. So now it's given a list of the tables. I, I reduced this to five, returned five, but it listed all my tables. So this code's secure, so now he can maybe start deleting tables or pulling tables down. They can do, I, I'm not a security expert, but they can do lots of stuff and bad stuff. <laughs> so that's the SQL injection. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through, demo those, and then we'll start logging stuff with FuseGuard and start blocking stuff with FuseGuard. So this is a SQL injection attack. And then this is a cross-site scripting attack where, so we have this, I don't know, I haven't did this for quite a while, but when I first started Cold Fusion, maybe I have a message when I started coding, and then I'd pass in, you know, like a error or something. And so this change down here in my message is error. And I didn't do any kind of protection on that variable, I just outputted it right away. So then the hacker can see, oh, there's this hack, this error message and it's coming in here. So then they might add this to the URL. Oh, one thing I noticed when I was doing this this weekend is Chrome actually blocks some of these uh, cross-site scripting attempts. So it's built into Chrome to block some of these. So I had to use Firefox. <laughs> so we'll add this now. And whoops. So we'll add this one. And what this will do is this will put an image on the page. And this is where maybe if he's authenticated somewhere, they might link to some other site. So this will throw an image on it. So now 
if I mouse over that, that image, it threw JavaScript on my page. So that's another one. Here's another example, like a search. Maybe uh, you do a search, and then maybe the search came back inside the search so they know what they searched on. And then if you added this here to this, it doesn't look like anything really happened. But when I mouse over this, it's going to show me my cookies, like CFID and token and stuff. So this is stuff that the hacker is injecting into the website. The way to block this on the code side was to, to use a HTML edit format. Sometimes people say to use that, which I've heard is not secure. And use a XML format, I think it is. And that one's not really secure. The one I've heard that it's pretty good is there's an ISAPI plugin that's built in when you, I think it's one dot, when you upgrade ColdFusion 9, you'll get it built in so you can use that. Peter Freetake has a post on that. So you could use that when stuff comes in through the URL to, to filter it. And so here's another one. So this is a permanent one. So this is from the database. I changed this. Oops, moused over that. So it from the database. And then maybe the hacker, it's a text field, text area. So the hacker might put this in to the code and then save it. And so now on every page, there's this new link here called test, and it might do something malicious. And now this is permanent on the page because it's the database call. So URL session hijacking. So this is what I was talking about, CF location. Um, if you don't add, what was that we were talking about today? Add that parameter for CF. It's like add token equals false. That's not defaulted on when you use CF location. So you need to add that to all your CF locations. After I got that checklist, that's like the first thing I did to my code. You just search, find all your CF locations and add that parameter, uh, add token equals false. So this doesn't happen. Because what, what this does is now the session, if the, if the person copied this and sent the email to somebody else, we'll open up Chrome. So it's a different session. And so they, they used it. And the session information is still the same. See, hi, Bob. It's probably the same CFID. If we go back to Firefox. So now that person that you clicked on that link that somebody emailed them is now logged in as that person. And so FuseGuard, there's one filter that'll block this request from ever happening. So if it sees CFID or CF token in there, it'll block the request. So there won't be session hijacking that way. Um, so that was that one. And then malicious file uploads. So FuseGuard will block that. So let's say we upload a WWS. I'm not sure what I'm blocking. Okay, so that Mimi type wasn't there. So I have some protection on like checking the Mimi types. But if I could, there's ways I'm not, uh, I'm not as smart as Peter Freetag, but he showed ways where you could fake the Mimi type probably with a CF header and fake the Mimi type so you could upload the file. And so we'll block it with a fuse guard here. And then this one's interesting. I've never really thought of this one as a security risk. So your, your, your URL here, um, for your query string, that can be up to 2,083 characters long. So that gives the hacker that much room to be able to do stuff and to pass stuff into your, your URL through a query string. So this check will block stuff if it's over a certain amount. So like here's a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with data tables. It's a cool little plugin, jQuery plugin, that'll change any text or table <coughs> into like a searchable form. It's pretty cool. But if you use it for server-side processing, it adds a huge uh, uh, query or query string at the end of it. So it looks something like this, this long thing. And then it returns some JSON. So we'll block requests. Uh, you can have a 
fuse guard block requests over so much. So what you'd probably want to do is you'd probably want to see how long your query, your URL qu strings are for your website, and then probably limit it to a little bit above that. That way the hacker doesn't have all 2,000 characters to, to try to hack your site in. So I've never really thought of that as a security risk. So um, when we it, when we do FuseGuard, I think I have it down to 64 characters. So it'll block this request. And then ID validation. It'll check to make sure the ID is valid. So this a negative six would should probably not be an ID, I would think. So this would work. It returned back zero users because there isn't a negative six user. But FuseGuard will check, and then you can actually see what he's validating, how he's validating it. And you can do UUIDs, he can validate, make sure it's an integer, that kind of thing. And so he'll check to, to make sure your IDs are actually IDs. So, and then there's a custom one too we'll show. I'll have to set that one up. So, okay, so those are all the examples that somebody could do to hack your website. Does that, you guys want to, does that make sense? Those, all those, okay. So now let's talk about FuseGuard. So FuseGuard, you have your, your code, I, I have it underneath in my www folder. And then, so these, these are the links we were just clicking on, the ColdFusion pages. And so all you do in FuseGuard is, if you have application.cfc, you can add it on your on request. And we're just using application.cfm here. So we would add FuseGuard, this five lines of code. And it comes built in with some configurators. So we're going to log our requests only. We're going to log stuff. We're not going to block anything. And I'd recommend this when you start using FuseGuard to start logging stuff before you start blocking anything. And so it's a folder that you, you get from Peter Freetech, he'll email you it. And then it has uh, the configurators in here. And this is all the code for, for FuseGuard. And so th this is the configurator. And pretty much it, once you look at this, in, uh, it didn't take me too long to kind of figure out what was going on. So pretty much the meat of it is down here is the filters. And so he's saying repeat offenders. If somebody is doing something malicious to your site, after he'll block it after 30 attempts. And so you set the filter, what you want, and then you add it to the firewall. And so that's, that's pretty much it. So here's like the SQL injection one. You set it to a firewall variable, and then you, you add it. And that's the cross-site scripting one. So it's pretty straightforward. And so these are all the attempts. Here's the data dictionary one. So after 120 seconds, if there's 20 attempts within that 120, or 120 seconds, it'll block those attempts from somebody trying to figure out your password, trying to log into your site. So this is all it is, is just this configurator. And you add, it, you add this snippet of code. He has it uh, on the website. You have this here, and then you set which configurator you want. And what I did was I copied the, this uh, login one, and I called it like a mycompany.configurator. And so then I just, I just said my company dot conf or my company configurator, and I'm using that one to tweak what we're using at our, our website. So now we got that going. And uh, FuseGuard also comes with a manager too, so you can log in and you can see what's happening on your site. So you can see we had six blocks today, ten logs, and you can dive in and see what's actually going on. So we turned on we turned on FuseGuard here, and so now let's try the cross. Well, let's try the. Um, SQL injection one. So here, let's take a look. So we got six block and ten logged right now. 
And so now if we try to do SQL injection, remember I just set it up to log. So now if we refresh this page, so it logged two potential threats. And if, the, if this was working, you could dive in and you could see the details and see why it was blocked. So, so, that, so that's logging stuff. So we could, we could try all these again and it would log them. So let's, let's start tightening down FuseGuard a little bit. And you see the beauty of this is I didn't have to do anything to my application. If I had an old application, I didn't have to go through and, you know, CF query pram everything. This, this will block a lot of that uh, CF, SQL injection. So let's uh, go back to the code. And then now, instead of log only, we're going to use the default configurator. And then the nice thing about the configurators too is, so up here is where you would put your email address if we we're using a data source and if you're using the Derby one, you would set that stuff up here. So, and then we can take a look at the, this configurator. Oops, that was HTML. So this configurator, it's, it's going to start blocking some stuff. So he's setting some block levels on this and some log levels. So here he's not going to log if, it was, if the IP address changed. So this one don't log when the IP address changes. So he's going to log it if the user agent changes or, you know, that kind of thing. So let's run this then. So we'll just reload FuseGuard. Oops. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's happening. It might be MySQL. So we reloaded. And now if we try to try this uh, cross-site scripting attempt, it'll block it. It should. And it didn't. Maybe it didn't reload. Let me remove this so it reloads for sure. Maybe he's not blocking SQL. Or let me try the SQL one. Yeah. So, so apparently the 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 default configuration one that he has doesn't have the threat levels to block those uh, SQL or the cross-site scripting one, but it'll block SQL injection. So this is the page the hacker would see then when they try to inject SQL into the website. So it's happening on request, so it doesn't even get to the to the page. We can try session hijacking, see if it uh, blocks that. Or changing, yeah, changing the URL, or changing the user agent. So we'll copy this, go to Chrome, see if it, so it just logged it, it didn't block it. But if we really tighten down FuseGuard, and we'll use the stri strict one, it should block all that stuff in. So it blocked. This one got blocked because it saw the CFID in there. So not sure now it's going to block everything. So this is how come you have to be sure when you start blocking stuff, you, you've been logging stuff and you, you know what's happening on your pages. Because now FuseGuard thinks everything is <laughs> is a hacker. So that's not what you want your clients to see. So we'll put it back down to uh, log only. Do you guys have questions or? Yeah. 
Yeah, this has been, I've been using this for the last three weeks and it's been a lot of, saved a lot of headache trying to go through the code and making sure all this stuff is security. Because it's given, given me a baseline now that I know the code is at this level. Or not, well, the, we, the hackers can't get up to this level. Yeah. Um, you were showing the things that you could do to hack a website. Are those for all websites or just for public media? Uh, those were for all websites, like PHP, SQL Injection, and Rails probably has SQL Injection. But I'm not sure since they use an ORM, some of that might be blocked. But yeah, that's, that's all websites that aren't securely coded. So. What harm would it do to have the first two where you just have the pop-up box? Um, have so that, that would be the pop-up boxes. Let's see. The cross-site scripting is here. This will, it, so this is, a, this is what uh, OWASP says about cross-site scripting is uh, See untrusted data. So, so with that cross-site scripting, is the the it'd be on my website, and maybe the hacker injected that, and then maybe they're passing some information to their website, some personal information, or maybe social security numbers or passwords or something. They're passing it through through the URL. Because if it was an image, and if you didn't have a like the image tag, you just had an HTML call on the image tag, it would actually make a call to the hacker's website and they could pass information that way. You guys have answers to your questions, Ryan? Um, you probably yeah, that's a pretty good example. I showed one, I think, a year, about a year ago at this meeting where we injected some code that looked like an image, an image SRC, and pulled the image from the other attacker's site and passed in, at the end of the GIF, question mark, document.cookie.cfid that passed in the cookies to the other site and another site might just log them or send themselves an email with them and then they could construct the URL back to your site with those cookies on there and then they've jumped into your session. Yeah, so then they'd be able to see all my bank information, you know, if I was logged into Wells Fargo and this attack happened, then they'd be able to see all my bank information because they would actually, the browser would actually think they are me on my computer because the cookie information because, you know, the web at the simplest form is stateless. So it needs some way to be able to manage sessions. Like, know that even though this request is coming in separate, it needs to know that it's still you happening. So that's where cookies come involved. So then it knows it's you still. And that's where session variables come in. So it knows that it's still you. And that's how he, he would just hijack your session. And then he would be in your bank account as you stuff like that. So it's pretty scary when you kind of start thinking about, like, if you're logged into Facebook and you go to some, you know, bet website that you don't even know is bad, they could have a link there to Facebook or something if you're logged in to Facebook. They could have a link to, like, like their stuff, because Facebook would think it's you sending that link to it. So hopefully that happens. And like it says here is, Hijack user sessions. That's the one we're focusing in on. But like deface a website. Like if like if you went to, you know, some like congress dot or congress.gov, a hacker, if they were able to do this cross site scripting stuff, they could put, you know, a bunch of malicious stuff on the government's website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they could just like yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cover up the whole thing and or put. Another one they commonly do is insert a link to their site in your footer somewhere, so you hardly notice it. But Google notices it, and it bumps up their site in the search app and the rankings because they see all these links across the internet going back to your site. They like, must be a good site. Everybody oh, so it's not necessarily malicious. They just want to well, bump up their. Right, they're just piggybacking on your traffic, so link back to them. Yeah. Well, I would. That's somewhat malicious, right? I don't know. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I, I mean, I kind of think of, like, stealing credit cards and that yeah. kind of stuff. But that is, yeah, yeah. It's probably not a uh, above-the-board uh, person is doing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we can cover these a little bit. So this is that session hijacking. That's the one we were kind of focusing in on. So this is level th uh, A3 of the top ten list. And this one is a, 
authentication. So a lot of it deals with just making sure that when the person logs in, the password is a uh, if it's it's a uh, hashed and do you know what hashing is? Insulting. So when I first started programming, I would just probably take their password and store it in the database. You know, so match it up. Oh, this password matches right. And what happens is a hacker, if you had that SQL injection stuff, they could go to the user database through the browser, maybe go to the user table and see everybody's passwords matched up to everybody's username. So, yeah. Yeah, so authentication and then just making sure that the hacker is who they are. Or, I mean, making sure the passwords aren't compromised, keys, session tokens, that kind of flaws. So that's this one. And then cross-site scripting. This is the one I was working on today. We were trying, I, I couldn't get it quite to work, the foreign filter, foreign post filter that uh, Hack My Site or uh, FuseGuard has. But what it does is, so this, this requires the person to be actually authenticated. So if I logged in, if I had the person's username and password, I was, I'd authenticate it them as them, but then I'd have my page somewhere else and I would actually, you know how it, you just post to their, you know, how the web works. You have a form and it just posts to the other, to the action page usually. So then they move the form off the website and might post it somewhere else, but they'll still call the website action page maliciously, if that makes sense. You can, yeah, yeah. So this will make sure that the request is actually coming from the same website. So when it goes to the action page, make sure that it's the same website. It's not coming from somewhere else. So, um, yeah, that's those ones. So, um, the, this is Hack My Sites. I mean, uh, uh, FuseGuard. So the documentation is here. It's pretty thorough. It was pretty easy to get going, set up. And these are all the filters that he has going right now that he blocks and then so this is all cold fusion like we were saying so when I was trying to get the foreign key to work today or not the, the foreign post you can actually dive into his filters so you can actually see how he's doing these filters so this is the one that will limit the amount the hacker can add to your URL so you want to make that as small as possible and still allow your website to work. So that will give the hacker less room to try to exploit your website. So you can see how he's doing that through here since it's in Cold Fusion. And you can create your own or you could change these here. So this one he considers a threat level 2 where just the IP address changes. And so this one's a 5 where the user agent changed. So you can actually dive into it and see what he's doing since this is cold fusion code. And this one is if the user agent and the IP address isn't the same. He considers that threat level 10. And you Except that he doesn't give you the code. He gave you the code, but he yeah. encrypts it? Yeah, he usually encrypts it until you buy it. Like oh, if you wanted the trial. Yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get the code once you purchase it. I didn't know if he was giving you like a jar file or what to make it all work. No, no, it, it was just a... Yeah, you just email him, he looks at your request, and then he'll forward you the link. And so, so yeah, I've been pretty happy. It's been pretty fun working with, pretty fun getting it up and going. So do you guys want to see more? Or I mean, I kind of whipped this up in the last couple of days, so I didn't have too much more to cover. What kind of uh, overhead is there for, I mean, you use an application CFM, so this whole firewall is getting instantiated every, every request. Well, well, actually, the first request, so then he's checking if it's defined, it doesn't, doesn't get instantiated again. Ah, uh, okay. So he's thrown into the application you scope. You've that before, okay. Yeah. It's yeah. Turn variable, it's off the screen, though, but it's just application, not putting in the application scope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I had to do it because my blocking was kind of weird. Right, right. And it kept blocking it because it wasn't even making it here because it was blocking it at on request, yeah. so, so it wasn't even, I, I don't know if you know the flow of the application, so it doesn't get to even your code, or uh, application.cfc, it, it goes request first, and so it was blocking it on the request, 
So it didn't even get to this page to reinitialize it when I was having that issue. So, but otherwise, I don't know how, I mean, we haven't noticed anything. And I noticed he has some ticks and timers in the source code. So you could probably uncomment those out and, yeah. and see how slow it is on your system. But we haven't noticed anything. And it's just, it's just so cool to be does able to. Does it check any kind of form posts? Or does it only get requests? Um, form posts? Yeah, like if you're passing a bunch of data in via form post and you passed a, uh, an ID in or you know something like that. Um, that's good, because I think I saw on the foreign one, I think he was only checking foreign post filter. So this is the one that'll protect against the S the CFRX attacks. And I think it was only doing post, I think. Huh. But you could probably, I mean, all you would have to do is change that to get or, uh, but there's probably a reason why he's doing it that way, checking for the post. But you could just copy this and make your own filter and say, yeah. change it to get, and you'd have your own for that one. Yeah, you need to extend this and just. Yeah, and I got a little crazy. I just remember when I was asking you about self instantiating or super, that super variable a while ago. So what I did was I had my logging one and then I created our company one, and then I extended this, you know, the logger one and used super to try to do that. But I wouldn't recommend doing that. I would just recommend creating your own from scratch. I was worried about a lot of duplicate code or something like that. So I tried to extend the logger one, but I would just copy that one and start tightening stuff down as you want. So, you want to see any specific blocking one? Here's the list. We can actually look at the code. So he's the here's um, here's all the list of them. If you guys wanted to see exactly how he's doing one, this one's kind of nice just to block if somebody's trying to do your try to log into your website, guessing the password. This one is if you I think if it had like a slash. I think FuseGuard would catch it for that one, but I, I we're logging stuff only. Back to the password one. That's it. Detects multiple requests. Once a specified. It, it says same client which contains passwords. It's basically it's basically passwords. like if if you've got a script that's hitting a login page over and over and over, if if it gets hit more than so many times in so many seconds, it stops it. Yeah, and you can set this. Doesn't matter what the page. No, yeah, he's he's searching probably, you could probably say search my form scope for password or search my, you know. That's not very, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're coding it right, you should have the standard three or five tries and then reset your password. Yeah. And it's pretty nice that it's in the language that you can, at least I can code. Yeah. And see what actually is going on. And the nice thing about it, if it starts breaking your website, just remove the that from the on application start or the application.cfc, and it's you're you know you're back to normal. So he's just looking for a bunch of SQL statements. It looks like. <laughs> See, yeah, it's crazy. You can learn a lot. Yeah, just buying the application and looking at it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that was that's pretty much my presentation. Um, do you have anything cool. else? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions for Mike? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>